Welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing human papillomaviruses and cervical cancer. Okay, so we're in the process of discussing the neoplasia process, and we've just discussed the hallmarks of cancer, which are these funny properties that cancerous cells have, which make them so different from normal cells, and which make them so dangerous. So, what we're now going to discuss is how do you actually start off with a normal cell, and get a population of cancerous cells from that normal cell? How does the actual neoplasia process occur? So, we've discussed the hallmarks of cancer. We've discussed all these mutations that somehow we need to acquire in order for a cell to be a cancerous cell, in order for it to have aberrant enough behavior to be called a cancerous cell and to be incredibly dangerous to the survival of the multicellular organism. So, our theories, the best theory we have for how you get cancerous cells is that it occurs over years, if not decades, by a gradual evolutionary process, i.e. you don't just get all of these mutations at once, you don't have a normal cell, it acquires all of these mutations in one great big bang and becomes a cancerous cell. No, that's not what happens. We think you acquire the mutations one by one in a gradual way, and that um, the mutations help to produce larger populations of cells, and those larger populations of cells, in that population, one of them can get the next mutation that takes you further along the way, because look at a lot of these, they result in large populations of cells being produced. So, we think, therefore, that there are a lot of stages in between going from having a normal cell to having cancerous cells, where cells in the middle of this process have some of the properties but not all of the properties, and therefore we wouldn't call them cancerous yet. So these are pre-cancerous cells, they're on their way to becoming cancerous cells. So, enough of talking about this in abstract, I think the way of making this absolutely concrete is just to describe what is actually going to happen. So, we'll come over here and do just that. So, the whole process then begins with a normal cell. So in pink here, this is going to be the normal cell that we're going to say the entire neoplasia process is going to originate from this cell here. Okay, and I want to stress that we're talking about neoplasia in general here. We're not, at the moment, specifically talking about cancer of the cervix, this process is believed to be the way that cancer forms all over the body, so all the different forms of cancer this theory applies. So, what's going to happen then? Well, the first step in the neoplasia process is to get the first of these properties, so what we need to try and do is get one of the properties in the hallmarks of cancer, and that's going to occur by the cell acquiring a mutation. So this cell is going to get a mutation, and remember a mutation is a permanent change in the genome that is inheritable by its progeny. So if this cell divides, its progeny will have uh, that mutation as well, so they'll inherit the um, mutation that the cell has got. Now, we think that the first mutation in the hallmarks of cancer that occurs in the neoplasia process is probably one that causes the cell to overdivide, so that you get a whole large population of cells that all have that first mutation. You start to produce a tumour, in other words. So we think that it's probably a gain of function mutation in a proto-oncogene that therefore becomes an oncogene and overstimulates the cell to divide, or we think it's probably a loss of function mutation in a tumor suppressor gene, which therefore leads to reduced growth inhibitory pathways, and therefore again the cell over dividing. So let me now change the color of this cell. So this cell acquired a mutation, it's now going to be in this blue color here. And of course, if this mutation, as I say, is one that's going to cause it to over proliferate, then it will do just that, it will over proliferate. And the key thing now is that all of the progeny that this cell is producing are going to have the exact same mutation as it. So they're all going to have 
this gain of function mutation in the proto gene or this loss of function mutation in the tumor suppressor gene. So they're all going to be dividing at a far too fast rate. So you produce a large population of cells that all have the same mutation that that first normal cell was unlucky enough to get. Okay, now, if that mutation was powerful enough, then this cluster of cells that we're now producing in this area might actually be visible, and therefore you can refer to it as a tumour. A tumour just means a lump. Now, this is not a cancerous tumour at the moment, so this is what we would call a benign tumour. It's a tumour that still is not cancerous. It does, the cells in this tumour are not cancerous yet. They have one of the properties of cancer, which is that they're over-dividing, but they don't have a lot of the other properties, and therefore we would not call this cancer yet. This is on its way to becoming cancer. This is part of the cancerous process. So benign means that it's not cancer, it's not harmful, it's not invasive in the way that cancer is. But it's certainly, I mean, it's a kind of misnomer because these things are not harmless because they can go on to become cancerous. They are part of the process by which cancer arises. Okay, so we will refer to this population of cells now as clone one because all of the cells in this population are identical to one another, so they're all clones, and this is the first clone on the way to becoming cancerous. So these cells now are much, well, they're further along the process to becoming cancerous, they're closer to being cancerous than the normal cell was. So you get mutation, and I might even just call that mutation number one there. And I'll just annotate this on. We think that mutation number one, the first mutation that is most likely to occur that starts the whole neoplasia process off is either going to be a gain of function mutation in a proto-oncogene, which I've abbreviated down to PO, or we think it's going to be a loss of function mutation in a tumor suppressor gene, which I'll abbreviate down to TS. Okay, so that's occurred, and of course the mutation occurs by chance. You get a chance mutation in this normal cell, which just by chance happens to affect one of the proto-oncogenes or one of the tumor suppressor genes and leads to the cell over-dividing. Now, of course, this is very rare that this will occur. Often, if you get DNA damage, it won't lead to a mutation because of the DNA repair mechanisms. And places where you do get mutations, it won't usually be in a proto-oncogene or a tumor suppressor gene. I mean, this mutation could have ended up being in, I don't know, complex four of the electron transport chain, and it could have led to loss of function of that protein, and of course that would have blocked aerobic respiration, and it would have killed the cell. So many mutations will just kill the cell, and they won't lead to the formation of cancer. So we've got a rare event here. I am, you know, we're spelling out the process by which neoplasia occurs. I'm not saying that this is a common thing to occur, but in the process of neoplasia, this is what has occurred according to our theories. So, where you're going to get cancer forming, the cell is going to, uh, a cell is initially going to get a mutation, and this mutation just by chance is going to either be a gain of function mutation in the proto-oncogene or a loss of function mutation in a tumor suppressor gene, and that allows the cell to over-divide and produce a whole clone of cells that are all over-dividing, and that we would now refer to as a benign tumour. It's part of the neoplasia process towards being cancerous. And the other thing that I should mention, of course, is that many chemicals are mutagens. They promote mutations occurring. So, obviously, the famous uh, one is a lot of the chemicals in cigarette smoke are mutagens and they make mutations much more likely. Uh, so if you're exposing cells to mutagens, then you increase the number of mutations that are occurring and therefore uh, you increase the chance that in one of the cells that is uh, undergoing a mutation, um, that it will be a mutation in a 
proto-oncogene or a tumor suppressor gene and that it will start off the neoplasia process. So a mutagen is any sort of agent, any sort of chemical, well not necessarily a chemical because radiation also counts, any sort of agent is the right thing to say uh, that promotes mutations occurring and the more mutations that you have in different cells in a tissue the more likely it is that somewhere one of the cells will get a mutation that takes it along the process towards being cancerous. Okay, back onto the process then, because we have not got to cancer yet. Now, of course, what has to happen is in this clone of cells, in this clone one, what has to happen is one of the cells in this clone needs to get a further mutation that is going to give it another one of the properties of cancer and therefore take us along the process further. Now, just as I said before, mutations are rare and most of the mutations that occur in cells in this clone one will be awful mutations that won't take you any further away to cancer and will just kill the cell. Again, I'll give you the example of maybe it could get a mutation in one of the proteins in complex four and that would kill the cell. Um, but if you wait long enough and if you expose the cells to enough mutagens, then eventually one of the cells in this clone will unfortunately end up getting a mutation that gives it another one of the properties of cancer. Now, we think that potentially the next mutation that occurs, and I should say that when I'm telling you specifically the order that these mutations occur, this is very sort of speculative. This is to make it nice and easy to understand. In reality, these mutations might occur in very different orders. The idea is that we're just gradually accumulating more mutations which give us more of the properties of cancer. What order those mutations occur in? Uh, is just speculative, but we do generally think that what happens first is one that causes overproliferation, so that you get a great big population of cells that all have the same mutation, which means that you've got a much more chance of getting another mutation because you've got so many more cells that you can get that mutation in. Okay, so we think that the next mutation that occurs might be one that gives rise to genetic instability. So let's choose a special cell. So let's say this cell here, and that doesn't really make it look special, so I'll come up with a more vivid colour. So let's say this cell here, and then in fact that doesn't even make it look special. Let me get a thick pen. This cell here, which I've highlighted in the evil red here, is going to get another mutation, okay? This is going to give it another one of the properties of cancer. So, oh, damn. Let me go back to the fin pen. So what's going to happen now is mutation two. And as I say, loads of other mutations will be occurring in this population of cells, but we don't care about them because they're not taking you any further along the way to cancer. Mutation two is the one that's going to take us further along the way to cancer. And for a nice simple model, we think that mutation two might be one that gives rise to genetic instability, one that makes it more likely that you're going to get uh, mutations. Because of course, if you've got a population of cells that are genetically unstable, whoops, I put genetic stability, genetic instability. If you've got a population of cells that are genetically unstable, then the rate of mutations will be much higher and therefore the rate at which we proceed along the carcinogenesis process, the rate at which we acquire mutations that take us further towards having the properties of a cancerous cell is going to be sped up. So we think that genetic instability is probably one of the important um, properties that the cells acquire early on in the neoplasia process. So let's now go to another colour. So we'll have the next clone of cells in this green colour here. So here is our next clone of cells. Okay, right, so now I need to be more careful. So this cell here has got this second mutation that is going to allow it to be genetically unstable. It already has a mutation that allows it to divide very fast. So now it's going to give rise to a population of cells that I am drawing in green here, which are both dividing too fast and which are genetically unstable. Now, of course, you will still have cells in our benign tumour that will be of the blue type, i.e. that will not be genetically unstable, but will still have the property of 
dividing too fast. So this is a very important concept that in a tumour, all of the cells are not genetically identical to one another. This is a concept called intratumor heterogeneity. So I'll just write this key word or key term down here. So intratumor refers, of course, to inside a tumor within a tumor. And then heterogeneity refers to the fact that the genomes are different. Hetero means different. And geneity refers to the genomes, so different genomes. So this is a really important concept that in this benign tumour now, we have two different clones of cells that are both different ways along to the process of being cancerous. Yeah, well, in the process of becoming cancerous. So we've got clone one, we've still got the clone one cells here in blue, and now we've got a more advanced clone of cells here in green, and this, of course, I will call clone two. So we don't really care about clone one now because clone two is more advanced and clone two is now going to go on further along the neoplastic process. Uh, but it's important to acknowledge that clone one cells will still be there. Okay, so where have we got to then now? We've got this clone two of cells which are over dividing. They have the property that they over divide. They're also genetically unstable. So they're going to all be acquiring mutations at a much faster rate than cells in clone one. And therefore the next stage in the process towards becoming cancerous is for one of the cells in clone two to get a further mutation that gives it another one of the properties of cancer. And this process is going to go on. I think I will just put another one and I'll put another um, another stage in just to make sure that everyone is clear of the process. So in green here, one of the cells in clone two is going to get mutation number three. And again, I'm calling this mutation number three, but it will not have been the third mutation. It's the third significant mutation that's actually moving us along in the neoplasia process. And I'll again stress that, you know, these arrows will take years. It will take in years to get a normal cell to produce a clone one of cells just by chance and by unlucky chance. Then in clone one, it will take a long, long time for, before a cell gets mutation two that takes you further along and gives you clone two. And now mutation three will take less time because of the fact that clone two cells are all genetically unstable, so mutations are occurring quicker. So now everything speeds up because we have got genetic instability. Okay, so what could mutation three be? Well, now we're not so sure. Um, we do think that these two occur very early on. Mutation three could be you know, any mutation that gives rise to uh, or helps in creating the properties of cancer. So it could be another gain of function mutation in another proto-oncogene that makes the cells divide even more rapidly. Or it could be another loss of function mutation in a different tumor suppressor gene that makes the cells divide even more rapidly. Or it could be a mutation in the apoptosis process that destroys the apoptotic mechanism. Or it could be a mutation in the promoter of the telomerase enzyme, which gives rise to more telomerase being produced. And the point is that it's something that gives the cells another one of the properties that takes them closer to cancer. And that will probably lead to them being able to over-divide even more, because a lot of those properties involve the cells being able to over-divide. So for instance, losing the apoptosis process, that will help produce even more cells because it will stop cells from committing apoptosis. And you do have to realize that in this population of cells, in clone one and indeed in clone two, when the cells were behaving aberrantly, if we haven't had a loss of the apoptotic mechanism, a lot of them will be committing apoptosis because they'll be doing what they should be doing to protect the multicellular organism, which is killing themselves when they recognize that their signaling and their behavior is so abnormal. Okay, so uh, loss of the apoptotic mechanism would lead to therefore more cells and surviving and not committing apoptosis. So mutation three, I'm not going to say specifically what sort of mutation it is, but it will be another mutation that takes you further along the way to becoming cancerous and will now end up with clone three. So let's have clone three here in blue. And I really want to exaggerate how much clone three is now going to be um, 
producing as far as cells are concerned. So clone free is going to be a nice big one now. So let's imagine that it got another gain of function mutation maybe in another proto-oncogene. So you've got a massive great population of cells which is clone free here in blue. And then you'll still have some remnants of clone 2 and some remnants of clone 1 around as well. So here are some remnants of clone 2 here in green. And I'll just put on some remnants of clone 1 as well. So we'll have a remnant of clone 1 here, a remnant of clone 1 here, a remnant of clone 1 here, etc. You get the idea. Intratumor heterogeneity. So... Here in blue, this is clone three. And now the process will continue on and on and on, and you'll gradually get more and more advanced clones that will have more of the properties of cancer. And as they get more of the properties of cancer, they'll be able to divide more and more and more. So you'll get bigger populations of those cells producing. The tumor will get bigger and bigger and bigger. So let me give you a piece of terminology to describe this process. So we often describe this process as a microevolutionary process because it's a tiny evolutionary process concerning just the cells here. You see, the more advanced clones that you're gradually getting, so clone 1 to clone 2 to clone 3, they're getting better and better at producing a large population of cells. They're getting better and better at surviving. They're becoming more and more competitive and they're outcompeting the older clones. So that's why we refer to it as a microevolutionary process, because we're acquiring these random mutations that are giving the su successive clones advantages over the previous clones and therefore gradually the tumour is evolving, it's changing so that the newer clone comes to dominate the tumour because it's being selected for, it is the fittest if you like, it's Darwinian selection, um, it's the survival of the fittest and the clone that has more of the properties of cancerous cells is best able to survive because that's what cancerous cells are all about. They are horrible, aggressive cells that are very, very good at surviving. So we often divide, uh, describe them, the neoplasia process, as a microevolutionary process. So let's imagine then that this has gone on and on and on. We might be on, I don't know, clone seven or something, um, and we are still not quite cancer because the final property that the cells need to acquire in order to become cancer is that they need to become invasive. Once they become invasive, that's when it becomes cancer. So when you've got a great big benign tumour that has, you know, a clone of cells that dominates it, the most advanced clone of cells that dominates the tumour, uh, that has a huge number of the properties of cancer, but it doesn't have the invasive property yet. We have a name for that, and it's called carcinoma in situ, or cancer in situ, I should say, rather than carcinoma in situ, because carcinoma refers to a specific type of cancer. So, right at the end, you end up with what's called cancer in situ, and this is still not cancer. This is still a benign tumour because it has not got the invasive property yet. In order to become cancer, it has to then acquire the invasive property, and we think that that is the final mutation that occurs. Well, by definition, it's the final mutation that occurs before it's then called cancer, uh, because once it's invasive, it's then called cancer. So let's just do this. So let's say these cells in bright red here, these are going to represent this final clone of cells just before we become cancer. So this is cancer in situ. This is clone whatever number. Let's just go along with the number that I said previously. Let's say this is clone seven of cells. So these have loads of the horrible properties of cancer, but they are not that invasive and therefore they are not called cancer yet. They are precancerous and we refer to it as cancer in situ. And the reason it's called cancer in situ is that it's staying where it should be. It's in situ. It's not invading into the surrounding tissue. What then will happen is in this population of cancer in situ cells, you will get 
a fine or mutation. So what will this be then? Mutation 8. So here we are, evil red has come back out again. So mutation 8 is now going to occur in one of the cells in the cancer in situ clone, clone 7 here. And this is then going to give that new cell the power to invade. So let's say it's this one that's going to get it. So you'll now produce clone 8 of cells here in evil red. And these will have the invasive property. So here they are in red here. And now that will be called cancer. So clone 8 is now invasive and it's now called cancer. So mutation 8 was the one that allowed it to become invasive. But clone 8 is not yet metastatic cancer. It doesn't yet have the properties that it can metastasize for that. It's going to need another mutation and that will come later on. So we'll have clone 9, which will then be the metastatic cancer. And I also want to stress that I might be oversimplifying this hugely here. It might require more than just one mutation to turn a non-invasive cell into an invasive cell. But to keep this simple, let's imagine that there is just one mutation that will turn this cell that was non-invasive into a cell that is invasive. And of course, because they're over-proliferating, the instant it's got that mutation, it'll produce a whole clone of cells that have that mutation. Okay, so that is the neoplasia process, and just to complete it up, I'd like to draw an arrow from this one to this one. And I should also stress that I've missed out all the other older clones that will be scattered around with clone 7 for simplicity here. So let's now just summarise what we have just learned about the neoplasia process. So, neoplasia is a microevolutionary process. You gradually get more and more advanced clones of cells that have more and more of the properties of cancer. And this is something that we believe takes decades to occur. So you start off with your normal cells here, and then we know that mutations, chance mutations, occur in cells all over the body reasonably regularly. A lot of DNA damage is fixed by the DNA repair mechanisms, but occasionally DNA damage will occur that isn't fixed and therefore you do get a mutation. So mutations do occur all over the body. Now a lot of those mutations will just kill the cell or they'll have absolutely no effect at all. But occasionally in a normal cell you will get a mutation that allows that cell to over-divide, and we think that that's the thing that kick-starts the whole um, neoplasia process. We think the first mutation that you acquire is a gain of function mutation in the proto-oncogene or a loss of function mutation in the tumor suppressor gene. Now, also note the importance of mutagens. If you're exposed to mutagenic agents, that will increase the amount of mutations that are occurring in your body, and therefore it will increase the chance that somewhere one of these uh, normal cells will get one of these mutations that allows it to overdivide. So it then gets that mutation and of course it overdivides so it produces a whole population of cells that are all um, overdividing and if this is visible it will now be called a benign tumour and all the way along this process right up until we get to the actual cancer all of these are still called benign tumours so you do appreciate how calling it a benign tumour is a um, it's a misnomer, it's not a harmless tumour, it's going to develop into cancer if it's given the chance. So um, it's not harmless at all, it's just not yet cancer. Okay, oh, and I should give you another piece of terminology. Cancer, we call cancerous tumours malignant tumours, and of course malignant means dangerous, horrible tumours. So... All through the neoplasia process, you have a benign tumour up until finally you get invasive clones of cells and then it's a malignant tumour and malignant tumours are cancers. Okay, so then what's going to gradually happen is in our new clone, our clone one of cells here, this population of cells that are all over proliferating, we now need one of them to get another mutation that takes that cell further along the process to being cancerous, that gives us a more advanced clone of cells. Uh, and we think that the second mutation that probably occurs is one that gives rise to genetic instability because once you've got genetic instability, you'll then get much quicker 
processing through the rest of the neoplasia process because we know how rare mutations are. We know how rare a mutation that will actually move you along the process to cancer is. If you've got genetic instability, it will increase the rate at which that occurs. So in one of these cells, after a long period of time, after a long wait, because again, mutations are rare and um, this specific mutation is going to be even rarer, so after a long wait, one of these cells in this clone one will acquire that mutation that leads to it being genetically unstable and it will then divide and divide and divide because it's over proliferating from mutation one and it will produce us this population called clone two, which is a more advanced clone and which will um, move us further along the process to cancer. And then what will happen is in clone two, you'll have a much faster rate of mutations now that we've got genetic instability and in, you just have to now wait for one of those to get a mutation that then gives it another one of the properties of cancer and you'll end up then with clone free. It might now divide even faster and produce an even bigger population of cells. So gradually we're getting the evolution of the tumour um, where you get these more and more advanced clones that are better at outcompeting the older clones. So cancer is really aggressive cells. All of these properties aid the cells in outcompeting surrounding cells. Okay, and then this process continues. The microevolutionary process continues. You get more and more advanced clones being formed in exactly the same way that I've described. You gradually get more and more of the properties of cancer until we get to our final clone that's still not cancerous, that's still a benign tumour, and this is called cancer in situ. And these cells have not yet acquired the property that they can invade surrounding tissue. So the final mutation by definition in the neoplasia process is then the mutation that gives rise to the cells being able to invade the surrounding tissues because once they can invade surrounding tissue and destroy surrounding tissue, that's when the tumour is really dangerous. That's when it's become a malignant tumour, that's when by definition it's become cancer. So I, just to give some numbers and make it concrete for you, said let's say clone 7 is our cancer in situ and therefore clone 8 is going to be uh, our cancer. We acquire in the population of clone 7, in one of the cells, a mutation that allows the cell to become invasive. It will then give rise to a whole clone, clone 8, of cells that are all identical to it and which can all invade. And these will outcompete the surrounding cells and we've now got a malignant tumour because we've got a clone of cells in there that have all of the properties of cancer. Okay, right. So now let me talk about the staging of cancer. So that is the neoplasia process discussed. I now want to discuss the different stages of cancer. So we're now talking about cancerous tumours uh, and I want to discuss the fact that we can stage um, tumours. So there are stage one to four and we'll see that stage four is metastatic cancer. Then what I want to talk about is um, the different types of cancer of the cervix. So, stages of cancer. So we'll start off with stage 1 cancer. So stage 1 cancer is where the tumour has, well, is still contained within the structure that gave rise to it. So if we're talking about the cervix and we've now got cancer of the cervix, it'll be invading the surrounding normal cervix tissue but if it's still stage one cancer, it hasn't left the cervix. So if I just draw a little picture of the cervix here, so let's say this is the cervix. Um, so just to orient you, this is supposed to be the external Rs and this is supposed to be the internal Rs. Um, if you've got stage one cancer, it'll be invading into the cervix. So let's say this is the tumour here but it won't have left the cervix. So it's still in the tissue that gave rise to it if it's stage one cancer. Okay, let's now talk about stage two and stage three cancer. So stage two and stage three cancer are actually very similar. Stage two cancer and stage three cancer, the tumour has now invaded beyond the actual tissue that gave rise to it in both of them. Uh, and the difference between stage two and stage three is just the severity of how far it's got. So uh, tissues that 
a um, cancer of the cervix could invade into are, for instance, the vagina below, the uterus above, so it could invade into the vagina, or the uterus above, or of course it could go into the structures in front and behind of the cervix. So in front of the cervix, um, remember back to anatomy, you have the bladder, so it could go into the bladder, and behind um, the female reproductive tract, you've then got the rectum, so it could also go into the rectum. So these are the places where the tumour can spread into that are outside of the actual cervix where uh, it originated from. And these classifications, by the way, stage 1, stage 2, stage 3 and stage 4, uh, they're used for all sorts of different cancers, not just cervical cancer. I'm just giving all the examples in terms of cervical cancer because, of course, the video is about cervical cancer. So... Stage 1 cancer then, the tumour is still in the actual tissue that gave rise to it, even though it is now invasive. Stage 2 cancer, it has spread into surrounding tissues. In the case of the cervix, the examples are the uterus above, the vagina below, uh, the bladder in front and the rectum behind. Uh, now, the difference between stage 2 and stage 3 is just how much has it spread into it. So if it's only just beginning to spread into the vagina and uterus, and maybe the bladder and the rectum, then we call that stage 2. If it's quite advanced, the spread into those structures, then you'd call it stage 3. So the difference between stage 2 and stage 3 is a little bit subjective there. But they're all about it invading other local structures. Then finally, stage 4 cancer is when you've actually had further mutations. You've got a more advanced clone of cells now that is actually going to be metastatic. So in stage 4, the cancer has become metastatic and therefore it's able to invade tissues far, far away. It can invade the brain, it can invade the lungs, it can invade all over the body basically. So stage 4 cancer is metastatic cancer, and that's the one that requires a further mutation. So in the cancer cells, in the final clone that is cancerous, what now has to happen is another one of those has to get a further mutation. So in this case, this will be mutation 9 here that then gives it the ability to metastasize. And again, just like we don't really know what proteins need to be mutated in order for a cell to become invasive, we really don't know what uh, proteins need to be mutated in order for a cell to become metastatic. But some protein, let's imagine just one to keep it simple, gets a mutation in it, and this now allows the cell to metastasize. So you now get another clone of cells being produced, which will be clone 9 here that will now have the ability to metastasize. They'll have the ability to go into the blood vessels and the lymph vessels and spread around the body and then come out of the blood vessels at far off tissues and then set up tumors far, far away. So this is clone nine. And of course, uh, tumors that are in tissues far, far away from the original site are known as metastases uh, or secondary tumors. And these are often what kill people with cancer because you'll get metastases in the brain and that leads to death. Okay, so those are the um, four stages of cancer. And as I say, that staging is not just applicable to cervical cancer, it's applicable to all different cancers. Stage one, it's still in the tissue that gave rise to it. Stage two and stage three, it's invading other tissues that are locally. Uh, stage two is less severe than stage three. And stage four, it's invading tissues that are distal to it, far, far away because it's become metastatic. Okay, so the final thing then that I want to do in this video, oops, is talk about... Um, the different types of cervical cancer. So now we're going to come back to cervical cancer and we're going to talk about the fact that there are three different forms of cervical cancer and we're going to focus on just one of them for the rest of the video. So cervical cancer then. So the different forms of cervical cancer, where do they originate from? Well they originate from different cells. That's what makes the different forms different. So you remember me telling you about how the endocervical canal of the cervix is lined by this columnar epithelium and that the ectocervix is lined by the squamous stratified epithelium that's non-keratinized. 
If you get cancer arising from the squamous stratified epithelium of the ectocervix, that is called squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix. So remember, a carcinoma means a cancer of epithelial tissue, tissue that lines um, lumens in the body. So, for instance, the skin is an epithelium, the epithelium of the uh, female genital tract is a epithelium. All of these surfaces that line um, places that are uh, exposed to the outer world, they are all epithelia. Now, tumours, cancers of epithelia are far more common than cancers of tissues that are not epithelial because of the fact that epithelial tissues are exposed to the environment and therefore they're commonly exposed to more mutagens than other tissues in the body. So, one type of cancer then that you can get of the cervix is what's known as squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix and this is cancer arising from the squamous stratified epithelium of the ectocervix and for short squamous cell carcinoma is often abbreviated to SCC. Now you should say cervical squamous cell carcinoma because you can also have squamous cell carcinoma in many other tissues of the body for instance the squamous cell carcinoma of the lungs um, so we should say cervical squamous cell carcinoma and this is carcinoma because it's arising in an epithelium, cancer of an epithelial origin, and it's squamous cell carcinoma because it arose in those squamous cells that cover the ectocervix. Okay, so this is cancer arising from the ectocervix. The original cell that started the whole neoplastic process was a cell of the ectocervix squamous cell epithelium. Now, this is the most common form of cervical cancer, accounting for 80% or thereabouts of cervical cancer cases. However, there are other forms. This is the form that we will be concentrating on for the rest of this video because this is the one most strongly associated with human papillomavirus, which is what the video is all about. And it is so strongly associated with human papillomavirus that we think you cannot get this form of cancer without having an HPV infection. So we are almost at the point of being able to say that HPV infection is necessary for the development of a squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix. And that is a far stronger statement than we can say for the other forms of cancer. So we haven't studied HPV yet. We're about to come on to it in the next video. But let me tell you, human papillomaviruses infect stratified squamous epithelia of the body, and they can infect the squamous stratified epithelium of the ectocervix. And we think that you cannot get squamous cell carcinoma, almost you cannot get squamous cell carcinoma without having an HPV infection, okay, of that ectocervix squamous stratified epithelium. It's almost, almost true. I think it is something like 99.99% now of squamous cell carcinomas of the cervix have originated from an ectocervix that's infected with HPV chronically. Uh, so it's really, really rare for someone that has never had a cervical uh, squamous stratified epithelial HPV infection to get squamous cell carcinoma. So this one's really interesting because of the fact that we could hopefully annihilate it, completely eradicate it by eradicating HPV infection. So this is the great success story and we will be focusing on squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix for the rest of this video. However, just for completeness, let me now talk about the other forms of cancer of the cervix. So the other form is adenocarcinoma, and hopefully you might be able to guess which cell is going to give rise to adenocarcinoma of the cervix. So I told you that squamous cell carcinoma, the original cell in which the neoplasia process started from, was one of the cells in the squamous stratified epithelium. So now adenocarcinoma, I'll tell you it's another carcinoma, so it's an arising from an epithelial cell, 
What are the only other epithelial cells I've told you about? Well, of course, they're the columnar cells that line the endocervical canal. So adenocarcinoma of the cervix, and again, you should say adenocarcinoma of the cervix because there are adenocarcinomas arising in all sorts of other tissues in the body. So adenocarcinoma of the cervix arises from a cell of the uh, columnar epithelium of the endocervical canal. And it's much rarer than squamous cell carcinoma. It accounts for about 15% of cervical cancers. Now, we do not completely understand how this occurs, but it is still associated with HPV infection. If you've had a long-standing HPV infection of the squamous stratified epithelium of the cervix that we've discussed, you are at much higher risk of getting adenocarcinoma, but we don't understand the mechanism at the moment because HPVs infect stratified squamous epithelia, not columnar epithelia. So we don't yet understand completely why having the HPV infection in the squamous stratified epithelium of the exocervix then increases your risk of getting adenocarcinoma of the columnar epithelium of the endocervical canal. What we do know is that it absolutely does. However, unlike with squamous cell carcinoma, where I can confidently say that it almost never happens without having a chronic HPV infection, adenocarcinoma you can get without ever having an HPV infection. So it is certainly not true to say that HPV infection is necessary in order to get adenocarcinoma of the cervix. So unfortunately, even if HPV infection, sorry, HPV vaccination completely eradicates squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix, it will not completely eradicate adenocarcinoma of the cervix because people who have not had HPV infection uh, can get adenocarcinoma of the cervix. Okay, um, so the final one, um, the final type of cervical cancer is one that almost doesn't warrant mentioning, but I will mention it for completeness, is neuroendocrine cervical cancers. Now, these are complicated types of cancer. Whenever you've got a neuroendocrine tumour, and they can arise in many different tissues around the body, they're always incredibly complicated types of tumour because no one's really completely sure where the cells that gave rise to them actually are. So of both of these types, uh, of all of these types rather, squamous cell carcinoma is the one we know the most about, adenocarcinoma is the one we know second most about, and neuroendocrine tumours are the ones that we know least about, um, mainly because they're the rarest. They account for about 5% of cervical cancers. Okay, so what is a neuroendocrine tumour then? Well, a neuroendocrine tumour is a tumour that arose from a neuroendocrine cell. So what's a neuroendocrine cell? Well, the word gives it away. It's a cell that is responsible for secreting hormones. That's the endocrine. That means it's going to secrete some sort of hormone or some sort of signaling molecule at the very least. And the neuro means that the control for the secretion of the hormone comes from neurons. So it secretes hormones, endocrine, and the stimulus that tells it to secrete hormones is a neuron, uh, a cell of the nervous system. So that's a neuroendocrine cell. This is our neuroendocrine cell, a cell that secretes hormones under the influence of neurons. Now, I haven't mentioned any neuroendocrine cells when we were going over the physiology of the cervix. We think that these neuroendocrine cells are in the stroma that is underneath the epithelium. So we don't think that this one is a carcinoma. We think that the neuroendocrine cells are underneath the epithelium inside the stroma connective tissue. Um, but we don't know much about those neuroendocrine cells in the cervix. You have neuroendocrine cells in many different tissues all over the body, um, but we don't necessarily completely understand what they're doing in different tissues around the body. So overall, that's pretty much all I can tell you about neuroendocrine tumours of the cervix. We think there are neuroendocrine cells in the stroma underneath the uh, ectocervix epithelium and underneath the endocervical canal epithelium, that layer of connective tissue that I told you about before we get to the muscle layer. And if 
the neoplasia process starts in these cells, then it gives rise to a neuroendocrine tumour, and that's quite a rare form of cervical cancer. And again, there is a slight association between having an HPV infection uh, of the squamous stratified epithelium of the ectocervix and then developing a neuroendocrine tumour of the cervix. But again, we don't understand why that is. So overall, there are these three different types of cancer of the cervix. Squamous cell carcinoma, which is by far the most common, and it's the one that we know a huge amount about, and we think it's almost impossible for you to get it without having an HPV infection of the squamous stratified epithelium of the ectocervix from which the squamous cell carcinoma is going to arise. This is the really interesting one. There is a fantastic great story for this, and that's the story that we're going to spend the rest of the video discussing. These two are um, much less interesting because much less is known about them. Of course, they'll be far more interesting in 50 years' time when we know much more about them, but at the moment they're much less interesting because we know much less about them. Uh, adenocarcinoma we know arises from the columnar epithelial cells that line the um, endocervical canal, and it is associated with HPV infection of the stratified squamous epithelium. The HPV infection does hugely increase your risk of getting adenocarcinoma, but why we don't really understand, because as I say, HPV is in fact stratified squamous epithelia, not columnar epithelia. So we don't really understand quite why, but your risk is hugely increased if you've got a long-standing HPV infection of the stratified squamous epithelium of the ectocervix. Uh, however, you can get these without ever having the HPV infection. Finally, there's neuroendocrine tumours which arise from neuroendocrine cells we believe in the stroma underneath the epithelium of the cervix. These account for only 5% of the cervical cancers. And again, uh, HPV infection uh, of the ectocervix does increase your risk of getting uh, a neuroendocrine tumour, but we don't understand why. Uh, and again, you can get these without ever having an HPV infection, so it's certainly not true that HPV infection is necessary. So from now on, I am drawing a great big cross across adenocarcinomas and neuroendocrine tumours. When I say cervical cancer from now on, I will mean squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix. I will try to from now on say squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix, but I think I will often end up just saying cervical cancer, but I mean squamous cell carcinoma of the cervix. I mean specifically this type of cancer rather than these rarer types. So, we will have a break here. In the next video, we will discuss human papillomaviruses. We'll introduce the baddies in this story and we'll uh, start to discuss their structure and life cycle.